Welcome, everybody, uh, to the first session of, of the day for, for day three of uh, the Internet Governments Forum. Thank you so much to those of you in the room and online for joining us for this session on the risks and opportunities posed by a new UN cybercrime treaty. Um, so whether it's uh, the first thing of your, of your day here in, in Japan or if you're up at an odd hour um, online, appreciate you joining us for what's an important and timely uh, discussion. Uh, my name is John Herring. I'm a senior government affairs manager at Microsoft, and I'll be uh, managing a discussion today uh, with an esteemed uh, panel of guests who we'll get to in just a moment. Um, but I will leave it to a colleague from the Global Initiative, uh, Mr. Ian Tennant, to provide some scene-setting remarks on, on what's at stake as the UN has been working uh, through the ad hoc committee process since 2019 um, to develop a new comprehensive global cybercrime convention. Um, which is sort of a process nearing its end um, and at a, a rather pivotal moment. But I will allow Mr. Tennant to say a little bit more. Thank you very much for allowing me to present my views at this panel at the Internet Governance Forum 2023. I'm sorry that I can't be there with you in person in Japan on this occasion, but it is an honor to represent the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime at this event. And on behalf of my organization, I would like to thank all the organizers and look forward to hearing the discussions today. This panel has been assembled to discuss the risks and opportunities of a new treaty that is being negotiated at the UN. I have personally been following these discussions since 2014, many years after the idea of a cybercrime treaty was first mooted. And throughout it was clear that there was no consensus on a new cybercrime treaty at the UN, which is why the process was eventually taken to a vote at the UN General Assembly in 2019. And while there is widespread recognition of the harms and the diversification of cyber crimes and the need to cooperate more internationally to prevent and counter these phenomena, there's never been a common vision on how it should be addressed at the UN. Since the negotiations started, the debate has been no less polarized. The committee has held six negotiation sessions with only one more to go in New York at the beginning of 2024. Before the last session in August, the chair presented a 37 page treaty, but ended the meeting with 40 more pages of text added by delegates, much of it coming from diametrically opposed perspectives on the treaty's scope, on whether human rights safeguards should be added, the principles of international cooperation under the treaty, and how the treaty could or should facilitate the sharing of e evidence on various crimes. Frankly speaking, we seem a long way from consensus at this point. There are some states who see clear opportunities for a treaty that would grant them unprecedented powers to surveil and gain access to evidence across borders and to data on individuals across borders under a UN flag on a wide range of perceived crimes. There are some who see opportunities in the treaty's potential for increasing cooperation, but also facilitating capacity building and technical assistance and seem willing to either ignore or look past risks to human rights and data privacy. There are others who see opportunities, notably on increasing cooperation on online child sexual abuse material, but retaining a clear view of the real risks to human rights and privacy that the treaty poses in the absence of a UN digital rights treaty. Achieving consensus on an ambiguous and broad treaty could result in the adoption of a UN convention that legitimizes or even encourages the targeting and sharing of evidence on innocent individuals, thus providing a legal basis for the UN to run counter to its own human rights obligations and priorities, and also putting states on a difficult path to ratification in their own systems. The committee can, of course, invoke its agreed rules and start voting on the treaty or sections of the treaty. But a criminal justice treaty created in this way would surely be an inauspicious beginning. And this would be a stark point of difference with the treaties on which this text has largely been based, whether Budapest, Antok or the UNCAC, all of which were negotiated by consensus. Throughout this process, opportunities to some are perceived as risks to others and vice versa. Due to this lack of cohesion and consensus, from our perspective, the opportunities have always been more difficult to identify and to easily become overshadowed by the associated risks. I hope in this panel we will hear from the state, civil society and industry representatives on how we can more easily identify and champion and fight for those opportunities of the treaty. 
and safeguard them from the serious associated risks that are very easy to identify. Thank you very much. And a huge thanks to, to Ian for providing those uh, very eloquent uh, scene-setting remarks, which I will not uh, choose to add anything to at this point. And thanks as well just to colleagues from the Cyber Peace Institute, as well as from the Global Initiative and helping to put this session on, and of course to IGF for, for hosting uh, this timely discussion. Uh, I want to just give a quick outline of how this will run. Um, for those of you who joined us in the sort of multi-stakeholder inclusion at the UN discussion yesterday afternoon, be quite similar. We'll spend about 30, 40 minutes in a moderated panel discussion with our panelists in the room and online, um, before then turning to, for the bulk of the time, hopefully having a robust Q&A, both with those in the room and online. So if you have dialed in, please feel free to uh, put questions in the Q&A throughout um, or add those into the chat. Um, or if you're able to take the floor, please do so. And I, my very capable colleague from the Cyber Peace Institute, uh, Pavlina um, Havlova, on, uh, online should be able to moderate that as well. And if you're in the room, please do be thinking about um, not just questions that you might have for our panelists, um, who I think are a really wonderful uh, wealth of expertise to have in this discussion, um, but also additional contributions and statements that you would like um, to, to provide at this point in the, in the discussion. Because the goals of the session really are twofold. Uh, one is to improve understanding of where the process is, what the stakes are, where it is headed, um, as well as then to also seek the input from the IGF community which as we've seen all week is just a, a, a real wealth of, of knowledge um, and from across different stakeholder communities and certainly important for this conversation around uh, a responsible new uh, UN instrument on cybercrime. Um, and I will only say that uh, in addition before we kick things off that building on some of the conversations yesterday around multi-stakeholder inclusion that were had in this room, um, the AHC process really has been a real milestone in what effective multi-stakeholder inclusion can look like at the UN in contrast to some other processes um, around uh, information security and cybersecurity. Since 2019, there has been fairly robust multi-stakeholder inclusion. And so while the nature of that won't be sort of key to or germane to the conversation today, a huge thanks to um, many of the, the panelists um, and, and to others in the room who have helped to facilitate that multi-stakeholder dialogue um, from, from both sides throughout. So without further ado, I'd like our panelists to quickly introduce themselves, and then I'll jump into to our, to our questions to get started. Um, perhaps we'll start with the speakers in the room, and then we'll jump to those online. Uh, just name where, uh, uh, your organization and experience, I guess, working uh, related to the AHC process so far. Sure, thanks, John, and um, first and foremost, obviously, thanks to, to Microsoft and the other organizations that are hosting us here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I appreciate the interest in this topic. Uh, I'm Mike Gillis. I uh, am with the U.S. State Department, and I've been a member of the United States' delegation to the Ad Hoc Committee uh, negotiating this treaty uh, since the treaty process kicked off in 2019. Thanks, John, and thanks, um to Microsoft and, and all the other organizers for having me here. My name is Timo Schutte. I'm the Global Digital Policy Lead at the International Chamber of Commerce. For those of you who don't know, ICC, um, it's the um, global business organization that encompasses around 45 million companies in over 170 countries. Um, and we also are uh, an official observer of the UN General Assembly. Um, and we've been involved as a private sector focal point, so to speak. Um, into uh, the negotiations of this treaty since the process started um, in 2019. can't believe it's been so long already. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. Um, to our colleagues online, perhaps to introduce themselves. Ladies Shall first, I, Brian. <laughs> Shall I jump in first? <laughs> or Claudio, I don't mind. Um, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bryony Daly Whitworth. I am the Director of Cyber and Tech Multilateral Engagement at Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, what that means is if the UN is talking about cyber or technology, it tends to come to our team in, in some form. Uh, I've, um, I'm also a Vice Chair of the Ad Hoc Committee's Bureau uh, and Australia's Head of Delegation um, and have been working on cyber or cyber crime issues not quite as long as um, Ian Tennant, but since about 2015. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Claudio Peguero. I'm the Cyber Ambassador uh, for the Dominican Republic. And uh, like Brian, I am also the head of delegation uh, for the Dominican Republic to the Ad Hoc Committee and also 
a vice chair and have been involved in this uh, from the very, very beginning. And like Ian, uh, and I believe Brian as well, I'm sorry that I'm not be able to, I'm not able to be there in Kyoto with you. Wish I was, but uh, we're here online. And so glad to have um, all of you join in, in the room and online. Um, and maybe sticking with our, our online participants um, or speakers, uh, Brian and Claudio, if I could direct the for first question over to you starting on sort of the optimistic, uh, positive side of the equation, and just from a, a government perspective, uh, what do we see as the opportunities presented by a new uh, UN cybercrime treaty? Certainly, cybercrime is a growing and very concerning phenomenon for many years now. Um, what are the gaps in the current international system that we think a, a, a new international instrument might be able to address? Again, ladies first, or do you want me to go first, Brian? <laughs> Please, Claudia, why don't you start? Um, and uh, perhaps let us know who, who you want us to want to start and questions would be really helpful. Thank Roger you. Roger that. Okay, sorry, can't help being a, a gentleman here. So um, I think that, uh, you know, for Dominican Republic, uh, being a, a Budapest Convention and member state, um, I think the opportunities here uh, are basically being able to cooperate with countries that for whatever reason have not joined or will not join the Budapest Convention. Uh, you know, personally, as a practitioner, I was originally hoping uh, that this convention would go beyond uh, what we have been able to achieve so far uh, based uh, also you know, both in the uh, Budapest Convention and the Mother Convention and now recently in the second edition of protocol to the Budapest Convention, uh, which by way proved to be a, a very uh, challenging and fun negotiation process. And, you know, again, I, I, I was hoping that, that we were able to go beyond that. Um, so the, the main opportunity that I'm seeing here uh, is that, that we are going to be able at the end of the day, uh, and, and I really hope that we really get a large number of, of uh, ratifications uh, for this new instrument because it, it would only be as strong as the number of parties that, that it has. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll jump in there to um, echo um, uh, what, what Claudio has said. I, I do agree with that. Um, I think it also provides a couple of other opportunities as well, um, uplifting and harmonizing cybercrime legislation across potentially all 193 UN member states um, is a really important opportunity that we have here. Uh, why this matters is because it helps countries work together to investigate and to prosecute uh, cybercrime. Uh, the legal term that we use here is dual criminality. And what that means is that police and prosecutors uh, often need uh, the same conduct to be criminalized in both of their jurisdictions, in both of their countries, before they can cooperate across borders. And um, as Claudio says, uh, this expands the countries that can cooperate um, from those 60 something, 70 something countries in the Budapest Convention who all have harmonized cybercrime legislation to potentially all 193 UN member states. Um, and, and so that's a really big deal um, for, for us um, and for our law enforcement agencies to be able to cooperate uh, with those really simple, common standard. Uh, cybercrime offences. And, and this also helps us focus capacity building uh, in particular and capacity building efforts um, because uh, it's much easier to uh, look at what countries need if they have already signed up to a convention and we need to implement that convention. So that, that really helps with focusing capacity building um, and also uplifting all countries' uh, investigative techniques. So uh, their digital forensics techniques in order to actually prosecute these crimes that we are hoping that everyone will be um, legislating um, and also thinking about the and understanding those um, law enforcement powers a little bit better as well their limitations in particular both their technical limitations things like uh, bias in a lot of the artificial intelligence work so and I know that's something that's being talked about at the IGF um, but also um, the limitations of uh, these investigative techniques under international human rights obligations for example um, and as Ian also mentioned, I think uh, one of the biggest opportunities for Australia in this convention 
is that it's an opportunity to move forward on some of the emerging crime types that we see. So things like uh, online child abuse and exploitation uh, is um, something that we have seen uh, really um, uh, explode in a horrific way um, over the last um, several decades. And uh, we would really like to see this um, convention move forward and have a, a lot of really forward leading uh, ways that um, it can criminalize the full life cycle of that sort of conduct um, across all countries. Uh, so um, those are a couple of the main opportunities um, that we're seeing in this convention and we're really hoping um, will come to fruition come February. Thanks. Thank you both so much. I heard a lot uh, there, obviously, but, but a lot of themes around opportunities for capacity building, opportunities for, for level setting uh, across uh, governments to sort of move forward on common challenges together, opportunity to deal with emerging challenges, um, and, and maybe sort of summing up a lot of this um, from Claudia's point was that theme of this is only going to be as strong as the parties it has at the end of the day. And I think that's a theme that we'll come back to recursively throughout this conversation. Um, but then to sort of flip the the question to the other side, um, I suppose uh, the much, much less optimistic side of the question, uh, what are the sort of primary concerns or risks? Um, and I know Ian addressed some of these, um, but I'd love to hear you both just, just sort of explore it a little bit more, uh, Mike and, and then Tamea. Um, what have sort of been the, the pressing concerns and issues that you've wanted to push back on, challenges you've sought to avoid uh, since these conversations kicked off back in 2019? We have slightly uh, less coordination difficulties here in the room, so. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, so look, Ian did a great job of framing some of the, the substantive risks uh, inherent to this process, and I think we would largely uh, agree with that um, from, from the U.S. side, um, that there are, uh, you know, significant potential risks uh, for abuse if we do not uh, achieve the appropriate level of, of conditions and, and safeguards on the sharing of uh, evidence and other forms of international cooperation, uh, also risks of abuse uh, if we do not carefully describe the, the scope of criminal conduct that is appropriately considered to be cybercrime um, that should be addressed at the UN level and um, should be the uh, sort of focus of international cooperation. Um, I want to also sort of highlight some of the political risks, though. Um, you know, there was, uh, as Ian described, a long process prior to the initiation of this treaty negotiation uh, where there was no consensus uh, as to whether there even should be a UN convention on cybercrime. And the United States was one of the, the many states that, in fact, did not think that the time was ripe to negotiate such a convention. Uh, however, when the General Assembly decided to initiate the ad hoc committee, um, I think there was a real risk at that time that this negotiation could proceed in a way that would um, sort of privilege and prioritize the interests of states that would seek to use a cybercrime convention for, um, for purposes that are not consistent with international human rights and other uh, you know, important um, protected interests. And so the United States has sought since the initiation of this process to engage in a way that um, protects against uh, the negotiation going in that direction. And that includes, for example, negotiating modalities that incorporate multi-stakeholder voices in every stage of the process to the greatest extent possible so that we are not losing sight of all the interests that are at stake. Um, and similarly, I think that there is a risk if we don't engage seriously in this process of communicating to states that are developing states, that are uh, members of the Global South, that uh, the countries that are already part of the Budapest Convention, that uh, already have the capacity to fight cybercrime, are not attuned to the real concerns that they have about increasing their capacity and ability to combat cybercrime. And so we have also been very mindful in these negotiations that we need to take seriously the real concerns that those states have, um, not only about ensuring that we are protecting human rights, uh, but also that we are providing effective tools for international cooperation that 
uh, all member states that are negotiating in good faith believe that they will be able to use to actually increase their ability to, to effectively combat cybercrime. Well, as, as usual, uh, I, I'm being turned to, to, to say what, what, what are the things that I don't like. I mean, quite feel comfortable in that position, so happy to share a couple of thoughts, uh, although much has been said here. Um, already by Mike and, and Ian and, and, and Bryony and Claudia also s to some extent. Um, it's public record that uh, ICC spoke out and, 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 and um, spoke up uh, against uh, having such a convention when the conversation started on this. We've advised um, that perhaps uh, there might not be a need for, for something like this. Uh, and that, that came mostly out of concern of um, not creating an instrument that, that perhaps duplicates what's already out there, uh, already in UN documents um, and elsewhere, such as the ONTOC and ONCAC and, and some of the other um, UN documents, but also not to go against the grain of the established good practices, um, such as the Budapest Convention. Um, so, of course, then the process moved forward, um, and, and as it moved forward, we, we, we engaged, and we engaged mainly for one, one reason, uh, is because we've saw some of that positives, uh, the, p the potential as well, that Bryony talked to, that this can become an instrument that level sets conversation um, on, on cybersecurity and cybercrime uh, in fighting um, this, this common threat that we all have. Um, and that it can, if done correctly and with caution, um, really become uh, an effective uh, instrument that, that can increase um, international cooperation between national law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies to reduce the incidence of uh, major cyber uh, dependent criminal activity as a priority and of course uh, an instrument to protect the victims of such crimes. Um, so this is why we uh, engaged and we engaged quite heavily in the process uh, since the beginning. A um, couple of things that um, at that time were um, our, our, our concerns and I think quite a few persist at the moment as well was um, the the scope uh, of, of the of the treaty um, the scope of the conversations um, in the negotiations and we really uh, advised that in order to make this an effective criminal law instrument at that time um, the scope needs to be really precisely and narrowly defined and it needs to start I think Bryony said already this it needs to start from elements that are common across jurisdiction, it needs to start um, uh, on the focus on crimes that are well-defined um, and that, that, that are defined the same way or seen the same way um, across jurisdiction. So this element of dual criminality um, was very important for us. Um, also, what do we mean by uh, cyber crime. I think it's one of the one of the things that that uh, it's we're still discussing it <laughs> in the process. Um, but I think we we and that's what we said at the time and what was our concern at the time also. Let's start small. Let's start with things that we can agree on, um, and and move from there um, because we've seen throughout the process, as Mike alluded to. We were skeptical in the beginning, but we really see the value, especially for, for states and, and communities that don't really have much in their current legal system um, that can help address some of these issues. They don't have the capacity. They really are looking at, at the UN to, to start setting some of these uh, things in, in, to, in place to have that normative guidance. Um, so it's better to start with something well-defined and, and uh, that is actually can become a helpful instrument, um, especially to some of these um, jurisdictions and these communities. Um, and of course, we feel that the private sector uh, has a lot to uh, offer there in, in building that capacity. So I'll leave it at that now. Uh, I'll have a lot more um, concerns to share a bit later, perhaps. <laughs> um, no, that's, I think, a great place to start. I, you know, I heard concerns around uh, rights protections, I hear concerns with not conflicting with existing international instrument, instruments, in, in particular the Council of Europe's you know, Budapest Convention on, on Cybercrime that I think almost 70 states are currently party to. Um, issues potentially with the scope of the treaty, what is going to be criminalized, what is not criminalized. You know, these were concerns that began at the beginning of this process back in 2019 and after years of deliberations though, uh, rubber has started to hit the road. Um, as last uh, June, we now have a draft treaty that has been released. Um, and so 
for the benefit of the, of the entire IGF community, I'd love to hear from our panelists, and this is not directed at any one in particular. Um, so maybe we start, if there are any comments online, and then to see if there are comments in the room. Uh, what are the things that folks should know about the current draft treaty? Are there major wins, uh, whether it's towards the things of, of, of cooperation that we wanted to see or, or against some of the concerns that were just outlined in there? Um, and are there sort of uh, immediate areas for concern? And maybe we just start with the government voices and then to Maya, we can circle back on, on um, some of the uh, concerns for industry uh, in a bit. Okay, well, if I may start, um, John, I think that at this point it might be a bit too early uh because even though we've been uh, already negotiating with this and, and have gone through two uh drafts and like, like ian said uh they doubled in size uh on the last session um now in november uh, you should by by mid-november we should have a new uh draft that will be um you know published by the by the chair in in, in this draft and you know the the last session uh, basically um, took us through uh, seeing a bit what was closer to consensus, what was further away from from consensus, and, and that should prompt this new draft. So I think um, we, we should wait to see what will survive and what we will not uh, in this new draft before we uh, you know, break our heads thinking what should be or not sh or should not be a concern because uh, it may not even make it to this uh, next uh, draft. Thank you. Um, I'll jump in as well and, and be a little bit, um, while, while I, I definitely respect Claudia's caution, um, perhaps I'm a, a little bit more optimistic. Um, in, in the draft, I think some of the good things we saw was a very limited list of offences, um, which has been something that we think is quite important um, to be very clear on uh, the types of offences that um, all countries should criminalise, and it's been very focused in the first draft, so we're very um, glad to see that. Uh, we also saw clear um, uh, investigative techniques um, for um, uh, how to investigate cybercrime and um, quite clear um, articles on uh, how countries can cooperate. Uh, the things that we think um, could be improved, um, perhaps um, is the way of phrasing it, is it's not clear how these different chapters interact with each other. Uh, and, and that goes to the scope question, which um, Tamea also mentioned, um, and, and how the list of offences interact with the investigative techniques in the convention and also with the international cooperation mechanisms. Um, we, uh, from Australia's perspective, the conditions and safeguards um, around some of these uh, uh, procedures um, are still lacking um, and we would like to see them strengthened. Uh, and we were also disappointed about the capacity building chapter um, of the convention um, and the technical assistance. We thought that that could be um, beefed up quite a bit as well. Um, and uh, just one point for the um, internet governance community in particular, um, you, you talked about major wins. And one of the major wins that um, we saw in that draft, um, and in fact, in the conversations that we've been having in the ad hoc committee, um, is uh, given the long history of um, this process, uh, at the very beginning, there were a lot of concerns um, early on that um, the convention might try to uh, stray outside of its mandate and into um, issues around the governance of the internet, the technical management of the internet, regulating telecommunications and internet service providers and, and regulation of industry. Um, and we have managed to avoid that risk for now and um, for, for our, from our perspective and hopefully for the internet governance uh, community perspective, that is a really major win. Thank you both so much. Mike, I don't know if you have anything to add uh, to that. Uh, thanks. I, I won't belabor the point, and I think I, I largely um, share and adopt uh, Bryony's comments. I'll just add that um, in terms of wins, uh, so this is you know sort of boring on the one hand, but significant nonetheless, which is a, a large portion of the draft that was produced in June draws on existing language from other UN criminal justice treaties. And um, 
you know, not all of that language may be appropriate for a convention that's being negotiated 20 years later or in the context of cybercrime, but it is, I think, a win because it is language that has been widely adopted in the UN system, is um, understood by uh, practitioners um, at all levels very well. Um, and you know, to, Brian, to one of Bryony's points, I think guards against uh, the committee steering into uh, uncharted waters uh, in a way that could be problematic or uh, create you know ambiguities in interpretation. Um, and then the other thing I'll note is that uh, as much as we certainly continue to align ourselves with those who believe that the human rights protections and conditions and safeguards on uh, the significant powers contained in this treaty need to be stronger. One of the areas where this draft treaty has already gone beyond existing UN criminal justice instruments is in the inclusion of explicit reference to uh, human rights um, and the incorporation of an article on uh, the importance of protecting human rights in the context of um, exercising the other obligations uh, and authorities contained in this treaty. So uh, there's still a lot of work to do, as Claudio mentioned, um, and a lot of uncertainties as we look forward to the next round of negotiations. But th there were some significant things to like about the draft that we saw in June. Thank you all so much. And I'm going to come back to you on, on the industry side in just a question or two, uh, Tamea. I, I think that's really helpful in setting the stage for, for where the conversations uh, have, have come up to, or at least what that uh, initial draft has said. Um, and it's a point well taken, uh, Mike, that by you sort of drawing from existing language from other treaties that you can hopefully go some way to reducing some of the, the ambiguity that was highlighted um, as, a, as a concern in, in, in the risks area. Uh, I, I do want to remind you, we just had like more folks uh, coming in the room since we started as we're the first session of the day. Um, we are going to have a bulk of time to spend in a sort of uh, audience Q&A or just comments from the IGF community. So as we think about, you know, what the panelists feel like the IGF community could benefit from knowing or, or being uh, looped into, if you have comments uh, in response or questions about that, um, please do keep those um, in, in mind and we'll have time for that in just a bit. And that goes for folks online as well. Please stick those questions in the chat um, if, if you have them. Um, but picking up on, I think, what Claudio had introduced, which is that uh, since that draft was released in June, the most recent thing that has happened is there's been a sixth round of negotiations, I believe, uh, in New York. Um, so I, maybe first uh, back to you, Mike, and then we'll go to, to, to Bryony online to, to bring us up to speed on what that round was like um, and what we sort of expect to be the impact of that on a forthcoming draft that uh, Claudia mentioned we're likely to see, it sounds like, late this year. Um, you know, do we expect major changes? And where do we expect the process between now um, and, and sort of the next session to, to look like? And what do we sort of paint a picture of where this goes from here, I suppose? Yeah, easier said than done. I mean, I think, again, as Claudio already noted, we're all waiting to see um, where things go from here. Um, and has already, as has already been observed, the, the draft uh, sort of grew uh, to double its size in the last round. So uh, the chair at the beginning of the last round had urged member states to focus on uh, using her text as sort of a basis for sharpening consensus that was not the road that uh, we took. Uh, in fact, many member states introduced a lot of proposals that had been previously considered and rejected at earlier stages of the process. Um, and I think that uh, that was not uh, well received by, by other member states, um, uh, unfortunately. So uh, I think coming out of the last round, um, it was clear, as, as Ian observed at the outset, that the committee has still not been able to reach consensus around some of the fundamental issues. Um, and I think that perhaps is connected to what Bryony already observed, which is that so far in its work, the committee has, up until this last round, considered each element of the treaty sort of discreetly and independently of the others. So if you want to take a sort of glass half full perspective, um, a, a positive outcome of round six was that it was the first time that we finally started to put some of the pieces together. And uh, Bryony and uh, her co-facilitator actually ran a uh, extremely intensive informal process at the last session um, to help figure out how the different pieces of the treaty dealing with the scope of its application might actually relate to each other. 
Um, and there has since been an effort to connect that scope to some of the other um, important elements of the treaty, most notably how it interacts with, with human rights and safeguards. Um, so we're, we're starting to put the pieces together, but we're awfully late in the day to be just getting to that point into the negotiations. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say is just in terms of nuts and bolts, so we expect, as Claudio already alluded to, that there will be a revised chair's text um, circulated publicly sometime in uh, November um, that member states and uh, other stakeholders in the process will be able to read and react to, and that will tell us a lot about where we are going into the, the next round. Um, uh, my view is that despite the lack of consensus, there was nevertheless a lot of clarity as to which proposals in the last round have a path to consensus and which ones don't. Uh, but the, it is really in the chair's discretion right now um, what will go into the next draft, and that will be uh, sort of the basis for our continued work in January. Brian, over to you online. Thank you. Um, my, Mike's done a very good um, effort of basically saying everything that was written on my list. But um, just to add a couple of points, I think um, from our perspective, uh, the monstrosity of red text that we came out with at the end of that is something that we are um, taking with a grain of salt. Um, to be honest, we are looking, um, as Mike said, there are a lot of proposals in there, um, some of which were made for political or tactical reasons rather than um, substantively um, uh, an, an attempt to garner consensus on, on substantive issues. So we're very much taking the chair's first draft text um, and looking at how those negotiations played out. Um, we expect to see some changes to that chair's first draft text. We had some really in-depth conversations um, with the majority of countries engaging in, in really good faith and, and really trying to improve the text uh, on things like uh, child abuse, um, data protection, the safeguards, the human rights, um, uh, law enforcement powers. Um, and uh, we can see that um, there are improvements to the chair's text that can be made there um, and that a majority of countries from a broad spectrum, a really diverse spectrum of countries um, are, are really keen to see. Uh, and also on scope. So I think that the, the scope question is, is absolutely key to um, where the next draft lands, um, which, uh, as Mike said, hopefully will be um, coming into our inboxes in November. Um, and, and as Mike mentioned, I did have the, um, uh, the honour or uh, perhaps the punishment, I'm not quite sure, um, to co-chair um, informal negotiations um, and sessions on scope with um, my wonderful Jamaican counterpart. Uh, and we did have a lot of divergent views on, on this really fundamental aspect of the convention. What does it cover and, and how should it work um, and which bits should work with which other bits of the convention. Um, there are several potential out of the box um, options that we've been thinking about um, in, in that informal. Um, and then also that um, I know other countries have been considering um, and uh, there are definitely conversations still going on outside of the formal negotiations um, before we're expecting that draft text from the chair, um, hopefully to influence how that looks um, uh, across the spectrum. And I know that this is happening not just with the, the scope question, but also with some of the other um, articles that were of keen interest to, to other countries. Um, data protection, I know conversations that will be continuing to be ongoing on the sidelines there and, and Australia is very keen to talk with um, countries and stakeholders on the child abuse articles as well. Um, yeah, so a, a lot of work happening in, in the background. It's not just um, coming to New York for two weeks and you know, sitting in meeting rooms in a UN basement for 20 hours a day. It's, um, <laughs> it's constant. <laughs> Thank you both so much for, for that update. Um, and that certainly sounds like really important work on that kind of theoretical red teaming um, of the text as it, as it currently um, exists. And it sounds like there is no shortage of work to be done um, between now and what is the last scheduled session uh, of the, the AHC process that will be in January. Um, uh, despite that, I, I know the IGF, to Mike's point, is we're always a half full community kind of kind of kind of kind of community. Um, to me, I'd like to bring you into the conversation though here as well. Um, from the business community side, uh, are there major concerns with the current draft as we've seen it, uh, and, and, and what were those? Thanks, John. Um, 
Indeed. Uh, <laughs> I think I, I agree uh, in parts with, with uh, Claudio's um, sort of optimistic uh, outlook. It, it's been difficult to to sit in that room in in in, um, in New York <laughs> um, in the summer and, and look at how that text really started bleeding red uh, from all parts uh, but but I do share that optimism that um, some of that we're hoping it's um, it, it clearly doesn't have consensus so uh, we might be able to look again back at the chair's draft and, and see how that negotiation in in New York, um, maybe moved some of those bits forward, um, but I, I personally am, am hoping that we don't have to be concerned with all extra 40 pages of text that, that ended up in, in that negotiating draft uh, in New York in the summer. So looking back into actually what private sector had concerns with when the chair's draft came out in June, um, and, and what we think that hasn't moved quite forward uh, through the negotiations in um, at the end of the summer um, are, are three three main buckets. We have a lot more to say, but I think it's there's three main main buckets that that are uh, important. One was already mentioned by my government colleagues here on the panel is how does the chapter on scope interact with the chapter on safeguards, uh, the chapter on uh, international cooperation measures, uh, procedural measures. Um, it's quite unclear, uh, or it was quite unclear in the, in the chair's text as well, whether we have different scopes for different parts of the text. Um, we would argue it's better to focus the same scope across the entire uh, text, um, especially when it comes to um, uh, evidence sharing, data access, um, and, and, and some of those other issues. That's that's the general point, but my, my government colleagues have really spoken to that. Um, point number two that I think was something that we really talked about a lot in previous negotiations and also in our submissions into um, as a reaction to the chair's draft as some of the issues that would, in effect, prevent private sector to properly cooperate with governments, with uh, law enforcement agencies, and prosecutorial agencies, in making cyberspace more secure. Um, and that is looking at some of the jurisdictional issues and conflicts of law. Um, as some of the parts of the text stand at the moment, private sector is really being put in the middle as sort of a ping pong between uh, potential um, inconsistencies in approaches across jurisdictions um, and uh, laws that are not defined the same way or don't expect the private sector to cooperate the same way. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, there are many, many uh, instances when the private sector uh, is asked by a certain jurisdiction to do something that if they would comply, it would break the law in a different jurisdiction. So what does uh, a, a service provider, uh, a data custodian, uh, supposed to do in that situation? And, and is it really up to them and their legal teams to decide whether or not uh, they can or cannot do that and who to comply with? Um, that's one. And two, um, is there a way uh, for the private sector to be able to enhance the trust of their clients and consumers when they're being um, prohibited from sharing that information back in a transparent way to their users um, and to community at large. And I don't mean this, you know, you receive a request from a government and you immediately publish it. Of course, there's ongoing uh, criminal investigation processes. There's um, things that, that we obviously know in the private sector that we, there is a, a certain amount of secrecy around certain of these conversations that is um, helpful uh, to law enforcement agencies and uh, to, to, to conduct their work in a proper manner and truly do fight some of these crimes that we're talking about. Um, but there needs to be some sort of limitation to that. Um, and the current draft, uh, as it stands, I don't think uh, moves that forward. Um, and then, and I go back uh, through this, uh, the segue to my third point. Um, it is a bit unclear uh, in the text at the moment of what are some of the data access um, uh, obligations <laughs> or requirements that, that the, the current treaty wants to uh, put forward. Um, that would, uh, again, obligate the private sector. There are very broad um, expectations um, as of 
when and how the private sector uh, should disclose the um, data of their clients and, and users, um, and not necessarily um, very clear safeguards or, or process points in there um, to, to share um, the details of what data, um, to whom, uh, how long, um, should should be should be disclosed. Um, who has the uh, authority to to ask for it? Um, who has to um, underwrite that request? Is this a, a, a judicial process? Uh, is this an automatic process? Um, and then again, you go into issues like um, interception, real time interception of, of traffic data, content data um, that is put there as, as usually a special investigative uh, procedure um, and that is very seldom used, but in the treaty as it stands now, um, it is up there with uh, the general use procedures. Um, again, uh, I think uh, our concern from the private sector on that regard is um, what should be there as a level setting sort of normative instrument that UN texts are um, to help move some of these uh, processes forward? Um, or are we, are we writing a, a treaty here that um, legitimize, legitimizes um, certain uses that, that are really outside of the norm, but puts it up there as, as a menu to choose from? So again, these are our three main concerns, um, but I do want to end on a positive note just so that I'm not always the, <laughs> um, uh, the person that, that gives the negatives. Um, I think there were, are a couple of positives in the text that, that, that we do uh, like. Uh, Mike mentioned um, human rights safeguards um, that are there. Again, I'm talking in comparison with other <laughs> UN instruments, but I think there is a step forward that those are actually being mentioned and are, are, are being mentioned in a bit more um, consensus-ready way that I've seen in a lot of the other processes that I've been part of. Um, I've recognized the chair's efforts in limiting the scope in her draft. I think that was a really, really good start. Um, the fact that the treaty draws from other um, treaties and criminal justice instruments, I think it's a positive. I would add a caveat here though, just because I am the one that brings in the concerns. Um, other treaties that this, um, this convention is being based on also have annexes um, and, and then have explanatory notes um, that go much more deeper into the safeguards and protections. Um, we don't have that. We are I'm not even sure that we are going to ever have that. So we need to be clear that when we lift from those texts, uh, we consider that in, in, um, in conjunction with other parts. Uh, and then the last thing that, be, that hasn't been mentioned before and that goes to your point on what should the IGF community know? Um, this process, as it stands, I think is one of the most inclusive UN processes towards stakeholders that I have ever been part of. It's not ideal, it could be strengthened, but I do have to note that, um, and, and I think it's, it goes to um, thank a lot of the member states <laughs> who were negotiating the modalities and to thank the chair. Um, those who have applied to be accredited to, the, to, the, um, to observe this have all been accepted and ever since then have all had the chance to send in written notes, to, to come to the meetings, um, the chair sets aside time, again, in the limits of <laughs> possibilities, uh, to hear from us, those of us in the room. Um, the UNODC um, NGO unit really goes out of their way to give us um, opportunities to talk to uh, members on the side. Um, so if you are um, concerned or interested in multi-stakeholder inputs, I think there are ways to do that. And Again, this is just a call. If you are a private sector member and you haven't been accredited, talk to us. We're always very <laughs> open to, to, to hear from others. But I do have to end on that positive note. I think that that is very helpful. Thank you so much for the, the comprehensive overview and, and also always for, for ending on a positive note. Taking off my moderator's hat and throwing on a, a Microsoft one for a minute, um, just to, I think, co-sign a lot of what you, what you just said, and in particular, honing in that last set of concerns you had around data access. And I think, you know, 
our, our leading concern is how do we keep this to be a, an instrument that can be focused on facilitating government cooperation that was outlined in sort of the opportunities portion of the discussion at the outset, as opposed to being a data access treaty. And that some of those sort of data access um, uh, elements that, that you outlined there, Tamea, would, you know, kind of ironically um, or unfortunately actually undermine um, the ability to sort of prioritize um, and, and effectively uh, address what are serious crimes um, and, and what are the ways in which um, we can streamline uh, our, our you know, sort of data access uh, processes that currently exist. Um, back on with the moderator hat, um, you know, one major concern from sort of the civil society community and human rights defenders in particular since this process began has been uh, the risks that a resulting treaty here might criminalize speech, uh, in particular uh, the you know, work of political dissidents or activists um, or other human rights defenders across the globe. Um, does the draft as it currently exists uh, set appropriate safeguards so that you know, more authoritarian interests uh, won't be able to criminalize such activity you know, beyond their borders uh, in, a, in a, you know, a third country that may well be a party to the treaty um, and, and where that uh, sort of free speech concerns uh, might, might be externalized? Um, I'd ask maybe uh, Claudio if we could bring you in here first online um, and then maybe back to Tamea for, for your thoughts here. Um. Thank you, John. Well, I think we have an advantage here, and it is that the Assembly General Mandate uh, for the Ad Hoc Committee established that its decision uh, should be taken uh, by consensus. And if uh, at some point in the process uh, we decide uh, that there is no, there has been enough attempt at, at reaching consensus and it's not going to be possible, then uh, if a vote should take place, this vote would be uh, uh, won by a two-third majority. So, you know, on, on the one hand, taking this into account, I, I don't think there's the slightest possibility that any provision that would uh, limit or hinder human rights, uh, uh, like, like you mentioned, will make its way into the final text of the convention. And then on the other hand, I'm fairly confident that we will end up uh, with sufficient safeguards uh, to prevent misuse or abuse of the criminalization procedure provisions and procedural powers of, of the convention, uh, even though they may not feel right now as, as enough, like, like Brian has said. Um, I think because of this decision-making make process, uh, if this is ever, first of all, uh, in, if this is ever going to fly, we need to try and find this consensus, or at least we need uh, two thirds of the uh, of the member states to to agree on it. And back to my original point, this is only going to be as useful as the number of parties that end up using it. So uh, that's uh, again why we want to avoid uh, getting to to a vote because if if there is a vote and we end up with two thirds, then that's the 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 ceiling that we we're going to have. It's only going to be up to two thirds and then for whatever time it takes uh, all these countries to, to ratify this, this convention. So um, again, I'm, I'm very confident that uh, that will not be a, a major risk, even though there may be uh, parties that would be uh, um, inclined to have uh, loosely defined things that could eventually uh, be um, uh, used, maybe not in a way that some of us uh, would not uh, like uh, the way to be. Uh, I very much doubt that, that that will be the case. Thank you. Uh, I, I agree um, a, a lot again with, with Claudia, and thank you for, for bringing some of that hope and, and optimism into this conversation. Um, I don't even think it's it's necessarily a safeguards issue. I think it's more of a scope issue in, as a first instance. And then we can go into, into the safeguards, of course. Um, I think what we, what we, I'm going to back to the basics here, but we have always said this should be a, um, a criminal justice instrument that focuses on cyber-dependent serious crime. Now, online speech is not cyber-dependent, it's cyber-enabled. Um, 
one. And I think if, if we go from that premise, then, then I agree with Claudio. It will not even, it shouldn't even be an issue in this conversation. Two, um, freedom of speech uh, is something that is fundamentally important to the private sector, and, and we are great proponents of that. However, we are aware, especially those of us who work um, across jurisdiction, um, uh, as on the online that that goes beyond national borders, that it is very difficult to define what freedom of speech means when we have so many different legal definitions in different legal systems of how what what can and cannot be talked about, what what is the limits uh, to freedom of speech, when does that end, and where do other um, human rights and fundamental rights start? As long as those things are not clearly defined across um, multilateral settings, it, I think it's very unfair to put, and I'm sorry to be this blunt, it's early for me in the morning, it's very unfair to put private sector in the middle and say, you solved this. It's, you'd have to take it down, you have to enable it, you didn't do it well, you didn't check it. Uh, it's difficult to put that in the middle because you, we end up in, in the space that I, I mentioned a couple of moments earlier, you are asking the private sector to break the law in one jurisdiction to respect the law in the other. Um, it is an impossible situation to be. I'm not a human rights expert, so there's a lot more to say on this from, from that perspective, but I think I want to leave you with that. First of all, this is a scope issue, and we need to solve it at that. And secondly, in the procedural matters, I think it's, it's subject to a lot, of, lot more multilateral conversation before we uh, ask other actors in, in, the, in the chain to operationalize it. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm gonna put everybody on notice. I'm asking one more question here before opening it up to um, questions either uh, in the room or online. Um, as Tamea noted, uh, you know, she's not a human rights expert and I don't think we have one on the, on the panel and if we have one in the room who would like to respond to any of these questions and provide additional depth, um, please do so. Um, or if you have additional questions to put to the panel, please do so. Um, and that includes um, on, on, online, so Pavlina on, on notice to, to please help us moderate that conversation if there are questions in that space. And similarly, as you're um, a speaker from civil society properly, please uh, feel free to chime in at the outset of Q&A if you have responses to anything that's been said currently. Um, but one more question for our, our panel um, before we turn to Q&A um, is that one of the challenges in commenting uh, international cybercrime has been safe havens, uh, countries uh, or which seemingly turned a blind eye to uh, cyber criminal activity taking place within their border, uh, is, whether that's a capacity issue or simply because that activity is not targeting uh, victims that are within those borders. Uh, for whatever reason, reports of those act of, of criminal activity taking place um, that is actionable uh, is frequently not having action taken against it. Um, do we see the current draft of the treaty or any of the sort of tr trends of where we see the draft going um, as being likely to prompt governments to take further action uh, against those groups, uh, whether that's a, a sort of capacity building or a sort of political um, effort that, that could be, uh, you know, prompting things in, in, a, in a more effective direction? And I might ask um, uh, Mike and Bryony to respond to that, and um, maybe Mike will start with you and then uh, Bryony online. Sure, thanks. So, uh, John, I think you already sort of sketched out some of the elements of my, my response, which is, I think if it is a capacity issue um, or a prioritization issue, um, then I think this treaty could, um, if it's the kind of treaty we want it to be, be effective in addressing some of these safe haven issues because uh, the treaty will provide for sort of the leveling up that Bryony described in the uh, necessary investigative techniques uh, and procedural measures the country should have in place, the harmonization of criminal legislation, uh, and then I think most importantly, the availability of technical assistance and capacity building uh, so that states uh, who you know, may have the will but not the means to combat cybercrime in their jurisdictions uh, you know, will have increased resources uh, and, and an elevated uh, sort of uh, priority on combating uh, these types of crimes. Um, but that will not solve the issue of political safe havens. Um, and, you know, this treaty, I think, again, as the United States and, and many other states envision it, um, is intended to be a criminal justice instrument uh, that 
should be sort of practical and narrowly focused on uh, criminal justice issues. And so we have actually very deliberately not used the ad hoc committee as a forum to address larger questions around, you know, responsible state conduct, um, whether online or, you know, in the uh, sort of appropriate uh, oversight of actors within their jurisdiction. And so there are certainly other forums in the UN system and otherwise where those uh, critical issues are being addressed and need to continue to be addressed. Um, but the, the sort of political uh, questions around um, state behavior and, and providing safe haven for criminal actors um, are outside the scope of the, the AHC process from our perspective. Nobody Briney. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, you've, you've both basically said what I was going to say, um, but I am going to um, be a little bit more controversial than Mike um, on, on the second part. Um, I, I do agree completely that um, countries that don't have the resources or the ability to um, effectively combat cybercrime, this convention uh, has a lot of work um, to help them um, combat cybercrime emanating from their territory. But the other category, um, countries which actively permit criminal activity to em emanate from their territory, is a much uh, more complicated issue. And I very much agree with Mike that it is important to keep um, separate uh, the way that we deal with and talk about um, these issues, the behaviour of states in cyberspace and responsible state behaviour versus the behaviour of uh, individuals and criminal groups um, which we're dealing with under this convention. But <laughs> I think that this convention um, can assist um, in a way um, in, in the way that we deal with um, states who are um, actively permitting um, those sorts of behaviours to come because it can have an effect of setting better international legal standards uh, and it can have the effect of setting uh, more normative um, uh, behaviours uh, around what states should and shouldn't do. And this leads us into, um, for any international lawyers in the room, um, uh, when we're talking about responsible state behaviour, we're looking at due diligence and, 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 and those sorts of issues as well. So I think... Um, while we want to keep them very, very separate, uh, there can be an effect from this convention if it's done well and if it's done properly, um, because it is harder to hide in the shadows when you have very clear rules, when you have clear law and when you have clear norms in place, and, and that can potentially have an effect there. Thank you so much, and we welcome the, the provocative responses always. Um, and so with, with that, there are mics in the room if anyone would like to uh, propose a question or, or comment on anything that has been discussed uh, already or that should be discussed. Um, and Pavlina, also over to you if there are questions online that you could either read out or if there are comments that you would like to make on anything that has um, already been said. And if not, happy to move forward with some other structured questions that we have here. Thank you very much, John. Um, so I do not have questions uh, online. I do have very brief remarks from, uh, from a position as a civil society organization, which has been accredited to the process and participated um, to the process. And uh, I just wanted to take this uh, opportunity. At the same time, uh, as I take my minute, um, I do support everyone who connected online um, to send their comments because this is a um, um, very experienced, esteemed uh, panel and a great opportunity to, um, to get your um, questions answered. Uh, so I, I highly encourage everyone to, uh, to send their comments or questions uh, for, you know, for, for, for an organization which has been a part of this, uh, of this process, especially since the uh, since the year early drafts uh, emerging, um, what is very interesting as a, as a bigger picture is very strong agreement on uh, among multi-stakeholder voices. And to mind that multi-stakeholder voices are very different voices. They are very different voices from coming from civil society, from human rights organizations, um, also from uh, private companies and research organizations. And these voices oftentimes do not find this kind of unison and, in, and united positions. Here at the multi, uh, here the multi-stakeholder community um, and the cybercrime um, negotiations really found broad agreement on key priorities and positions. So this is something to pay attention to because um, 
because obviously there is a lot of um, there, there is a lot of uh, experience and expertise uh, from this variety of uh, of voices uh, across regions which are pointing to uh, to issues which may be problematic uh, and uh, in in the um, emerging convention and also pointing to the way where it should be uh, where it should be going. I would also like to pinpoint the great cooperation between different groups, and this is something which already builds trust uh, as um, as part of multi-stakeholder community, but also with the states, and that will be very important um, as well for the implementation period of the treaty, because in after the February um, after the session. Um, the concluding session wraps up in February. We'll will then move to uh, to another part, and I wouldn't like to take us there already because there are too many important uh, moving parts to put together uh, until then. Uh, but building kind of trust between between the actor will be very important for uh, for really delivering the results for people uh, on the on the ground. I would also like to uh, highlight the um, support which uh, Tima mentioned early to a multi-stakeholder community from UNODC and their civil society unit as a, as a stakeholder participating in several multilateral processes related to cyber. Uh, cyber Peace Institute very much um, appreciates the modalities which are pulled uh, as part of this, uh, of this ad hoc committee on the cybercrime, which allow us to participate uh, fully uh, in the process. And uh, I also believe, just to conclude my points, that stakeholders are showing the value of the participation. We have seen so many organizations being deeply involved in these negotiations and bringing a lot of capacity and a lot of information to this process with their in-depth research to support their, um, their proposals, their recommendations and positions in the, in the process. So I think it's also a very important um, occasion to see how this, how this multi-stakeholder communities and state can come um, together to mutual benefit of informing, uh, of informing um, the final product as a, as a treaty. Thank you so much. Uh, and we have a question uh, in the room. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the great discussion. Um, I wanted to ask something about uh, private sector involvement. Um, thank you for the great comments already. Um, it's obviously very complicated, um, as already mentioned, because private companies have multinational interests. And uh, apart from that, these are dynamic over time. And it's very difficult to monitor them because um, new multinational interests can come into a company and publicly that information isn't going to be available um, for some time before the company is already aware of these changing priorities. Um, the issues that we've mostly been talking about today are around detect and respond activities in cyber. Um, and on the detect side, um, private companies are already sharing threat intelligence data with each other um, in order to better tackle their internal uh, problems. Um, is there appetite for a kind of voluntary model of data sharing from these organizations um, that wouldn't kind of require them to submit information, but rather they can submit it um, to some sharing platform already, or is that not deemed strong enough? And on the response side, um, uh, yeah, I think the issue of asking companies to do takedowns, that's very complicated. Um, is there any appetite for a kind of, um, or any discussion of UN cyber peacekeeping, which to my understanding, I'm not an expert in the area, is still a very kind of academic uh, concept at the moment. Um, is there any kind of resource uh, or interest in, in that activity? I don't know if you have strong thoughts, otherwise I'm happy to jump in too. Sure, thanks, thanks, John, and I, and I might ask you to, <laughs> to, to also, from, from a perspective of a company, ICC is a collective uh, of a lot of companies, so I'm, I will not speak to any one company's strategies on, on how they're being dealt with. Uh, I hope you can bring in some examples, John, if, if you can, from, from your own. Um, companies are very committed, obviously, not only to make sure that their systems themselves are secure, but that they help others in their chains to um, 
to try and secure cyberspace. But I think here we're talking about cybersecurity, not necessarily cyber crime convention conversations that, that are quite um, diverse issues when we talk about uh, them in, 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 UN, uh, in the UN world. What I think is the most important question is, is timing around disclosures of these vulnerabilities and, and, and information sharing. Um, I think it's when do you do that um, is very important and where do you do that is also very important. So you can detect a vulnerability, you can uh, notify perhaps your own chain, but the moment you do this publicly, you've put out the vulnerability for exploitation and patching up those vulnerabilities First of all, within your supply chains up and down, but then with your users, it requires time, um, it requires a lot of attention, um, and you know, acting fast is not only on the good side, it's only on some of those that might not have the best intentions as well. So it's very difficult, um, I think, to expect or, or even mandate companies for immediate public disclosures of vulnerabilities. Um, it is an instrument that is out there. We're aware of it. I think private sector and, and the public sector is in constant conversations around how to do this best. There's a lot of value in these disclosures, and we subscribe to that. I think the issue is timing, um, and the issue is the means. Um, when does that become public, and when does that become private? That's the other one side. On the, the content question that you've asked, um, I was on a panel er earlier. Um, and uh, I believe it was Vincer, <laughs> if I'm not, uh, I'm not quoting him wrongly, who said just on one platform, uh, I think it's on, on YouTube, there's 400 hours of video material uploaded per minute. 400 hours of video content uploaded to a platform per minute. How do you deal with that? So I think we need to think a little bit about um, what there's no way in physical human time to deal with that unless you use technologies um, such as AI, for example, to try and mitigate some of that. So I think companies are very engaged in doing that, but there will be, um, there will never be a, a moment where we will have no harmful or, or uh, content that, that, is, that, is, that is not, uh, it's just like security, I think, an ideal online content world will never be. It's, a, it's an elusive goal. We need to be aware of that. Perfection doesn't exist. Total security doesn't exist, neither in the physical world nor in the online world. There are tools, um, and I think companies are very committed to working together towards those tools. And, and um, for example, in the online content world, uh, GFICT does a lot of good work. If you, if you are not familiar with them, I, I, look, uh, I encourage you to look into whether that's one example that might be a, a good idea. I think it's a great question, um, and and gets to, you know, what can be solved with a treaty, and and what also like, fundamentally is not going to be solved with a treaty. And I think that actually underscored a lot of the messaging at the beginning of this, which is there's a lot of challenges in addressing uh, growing, you know, cyber security issues that you kind of alluded to, but also just broader cyber crime, um, where the sort of, you know, doesn't pivot around do we have the the sort of legal instrument. Um, on the detect side of what you were describing, though, you know, companies already do an incredible amount of information sharing across that ecosystem, uh, both formal and informal, uh, depending on the, the structures that are there. That's not to say that that's entirely sufficient, and it's certainly evolving. Um, but what's really encouraging is if you talk to you know our security teams, and, and really I think most major technology com company security teams, is uh, you know a customer of one company as a customer of another company as a customer of another company as far as they're concerned. Uh, competition kind of fades away pretty quickly and there's a, a fairly robust community of information sharing on an informal level there to corroborate um, what they're seeing as it relates to, to criminal activity um, or, or even just more sophisticated actors uh, threat activity. So that's good to see. Um, it's important to remember I think when we talk about what kind of information sharing um, you know, institutions and obligations should exist, that it's, it's a resource intensive process to be doing the kind of information sharing um, and mandated reporting that you'd be talking about. And so trying to think about what kind of information is critical to be reported um, and when and, and, and what the narrow sort of, uh, you know, rationale for that is um, so that we're prioritizing those resources, I think is, is always important. Um, on the response side, I 
similarly think it's probably really early days on like a sort of UN cyber peacekeeping capacity. Um, but I, you know, we, we certainly, you know, on the mic, I'll just speak for the Microsoft side, I do a lot through uh, civil actions to do, you know, uh, takedowns of, you know, you know, botnets and other malicious infrastructure as it really uh, exists on our platforms, um, you know, using the civil courts to sort of gain, uh, gain the authorities lawfully to do that. And um, we also have robust relationships with, um, you know, law enforcement agencies uh, around the globe that, that have sort of been uh, independently established over, over time. And I don't know that there's, um, I, I think something like the cybercrime treaty negotiations as they you know, currently are structured might augment and improve some of those um, collaborative capacities across jurisdictions. Um, and so hopefully that could be one, um, one positive way this could be uh, influencing that. Um, I don't know if Mike, you have anything else to add? Yeah, I, I just want to pick up on on one theme that you were just sort of getting to there, John, which is from the sort of law enforcement and cybercrime perspective, I think one uh, clear uh, message that has emerged in the ad hoc committee negotiations is that many states think that there is a sort of two-class system in terms of voluntary cooperation with the private sector, um, that there are some governments uh, that the private sector is willing to work with, uh, the United States often among them, um, but other governments that do not believe that they have the same sort of privileged access to information sharing and collaboration on a voluntary basis with, with the private sector. And, that's not to cast blame. I think you know you already noted that there are sort of um, capacity and prioritization issues on the private sector side. It's not just a government issue, um, and the private sector is often taking into account very real concerns about how information that is shared may be used by the government that is requesting it. And so, I think an opportunity that we have in again the context of the cybercrime convention is, as we've already discussed, to set minimum standards for how information is to be protected and used um, so that whether it's information that's being provided on a compulsory basis pursuant to a mutual legal assistance request or information that might be provided on a, a voluntary basis, um, more countries may have more access, not because companies are being compelled necessarily, but because they have brought their systems up to a level where your companies, other private companies may have more confidence that information that is shared will be used in an appropriate manner. So I think there is an opportunity here to harmonize and raise levels as we've discussed in a way that might facilitate both voluntary and um, you know, compulsory information sharing. Thanks and thank you so much for the question. Thank you very much. Um, also, my kind colleague here pointed out I should have introduced myself. Um, I'm Matilda Rode from British Standards Institute, but ex-private sector. So yeah, thank you. Glad to have you here and glad to have the question. Um, are there any other questions in the room or online? Please take the mic. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Anastasia Kozakova. I'm a cyber diplomacy and knowledge fellow from Diplo Foundation. This is a civil side organization we focus on capacity building. Um, I do have a question. Um, if the November draft from the chair sort of will be adopted during the sixth session at the IHS, um, how will be the next process organized? Um, I assume that it will be next stages with the ratification of the um, uh, adopted treaty. And my question is, um, do you see the risk that if the text is adopted, there would be the risk that the text would not be ratified with the, um, by the member states? Thank you. An important and forward-looking question. Um, I don't know if either Bryony or Claudia would like to jump in there first, otherwise I'll put Mike on the spot. I, I wanted to answer the last question. Um, oh, please, please do both. <laughs> um, but but I will. I promise to talk about ratification afterwards. No, um, I wanted to take off my cybercrime hat and put on my responsible state behaviour hat because I, I am the head of Australia's delegation to both processes. And just note that in in the security space, when we're talking about threat intelligence sharing, there's a lot of work going on. Uh, in the United Nations First Committee on, on this, and, and I would very much recommend having a look at that. We're looking at 
um, sort of all sorts of things around um, a potential threats repository where um, uh, threat intelligence can be shared voluntarily between countries. And, and from Australia's perspective, we'd really like to see the private sector and other civil society involved in that. Um, and we do have norms of responsible state behaviour in cyberspace that do include vulnerability um, sharing and reporting and, and things like that. So there, there's a lot of work going on in, in that part of, of the UN, not in the cybercrime part of the UN. Um, and, and just to comment on Tim Ayer's point, around timing being key. I think one of the other really key issues for any sort of data sharing uh, when we're talking about cybersecurity is trust. And it's building that trust um, between governments and the private sector um, and between um, computer emergency response teams and, and, and between others who are, who are working in that space. So that, that was my answer to the first question. But um, on, on the ratification question, which is a really scary question, um, to be honest, because it is uh, looking forward past the negotiation of a text and it is assuming that we will have a text on the 9th of February that we're all comfortable with, hopefully. Um, uh, and if, if we are, if we get there, and I think that is um, an if uh, and not a when, um, then, then what happens with that? Um, we'll assume that it has been adopted by the ad hoc committee by at least two thirds. Um, hopefully we won't have to go to a vote, but maybe we will. Um, after that, it will go to the UN General Assembly uh, for adoption there and then be open for ratification. And I understand that there are a couple of countries who are um, proposing that they might hold a high level signing ceremony as well. So um, that that's sort of the, the plan of action for next year. But one question that is still up in um, the air at the moment is how many countries need to sign on to the convention before it actually comes into effect, how many countries need to ratify the convention. Uh, and that is still definitely something that is um, being negotiated and will have um, a, an effect on when the convention, if, if the convention uh, is agreed and adopted by the General Assembly, when that actually takes effect um, and how many countries need to ratify it before then. Thank you so much. Um, Pausing to see if there are any other questions, either in the room or online. Please take a mic. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Samira. Uh, I'm from Sri Lanka, uh, working for uh, Dialogue Asia, a telecommunication company. I'm from private sector. So we do have you know cybersecurity business vertical uh, running. But my question is uh, on uh, different thing. Like maybe uh, at there in Sri Lanka, we are trying to you know pass the uh, online safety bill and that is at the parliament uh, level. So I'm trying to understand. Now let's say uh, this uh, UN uh, cybersecurity treaty, you know, if that is adopted uh, by a member state, how that would support or how would that add value to the efforts like, you know, maybe uh, passing the cyber, uh, online safety uh, bills, that kind of, you know, efforts, what you do, how that would support the member nation? Uh, I want to, you know, just uh, panelists, uh, expert views on that. Not sure whom I want to take a crack at that first. I'm happy to, if that's helpful. Sure thing. Um, it, it's a really interesting question because there is this confluence between cybercrime, online safety, online harm, cybersecurity, and how it all fits together. Um, and it, it's always hard because we pull this apart in government and put it in different legislation. We pull it all apart in the UN and stick it in different committees. But at the end of the day, we're talking about keeping the internet free, open, secure, safe, reliable. Um, and, and that does have a, a really close interaction. So I think when I, I'm not sure exactly about the content of um, Sri Lanka's online safety bill, but uh, looking at some other online safety legislation in the region, um, often it includes uh, things around education, uh, aside for um, everyone uses um, to keep them safe online. Um, uh, it will include things around cyberbullying. Some legislation does that uh, around um, combating the non-consensual sharing of intimate images, um, around uh, keeping children safe online, protecting the elderly, um, and some basic cybersecurity uh, um, requirements as well. So those are the sorts of things I'm imagining are in your online safety bill. Um, but if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but um, I think the ad hoc committee and, and the convention here does add value because it provides um, for, uh, it has a chapter on prevention, which does go to a lot of that work on education and cybersecurity. 
security. Um, and we are also hoping that it will include uh, an offence for all countries to include on uh, preventing intimate image abuse, um, which is non-consensual sharing of intimate images, which is something that um, is included in many countries' online safety bills. Um, and, and so we're hoping that that would also um, be something that adds value there. Um, but really, it's that prevention side of things that um, is often um, set up for in the online safety bill. And we have a full chapter on prevention in the current draft of the convention. So um, that would be the biggest link. Thanks so much. And anything to add either from Claudio or Mike on sort of the, the interaction between domestic legislation and the, the AHC uh, convention? Great. Well, then uh, I think we have one more question in the room, and then I've got a lightning round uh, to close this out. Good morning. Um, I'm Joyce Hackme from Chatham House. Um, thank you for uh, your, um, you know, for the, for the discussion, and great to hear the optimism uh, from the uh, state representative on the on the panel about the future of this process. Uh, we talked a lot about the scope of criminalization and the um, and the convention, but what we didn't talk about. Um, I guess is the scope of application of the international cooperation chapter. Um, and as we know at the moment, the direction that the draft took is that keep the scope narrow, uh, criminalization narrow, but open the international cooperation chapter up to be able for countries to be able to share evidence uh, on the crimes included in the convention, but also uh, serious crimes more generally, and serious crimes is defined as crimes with at least four years of imprisonment time. So that raises the question about, you know, the scenario where, you know, authoritarian countries, for instance, can use this, uh, this provision in order to share evidence on something they consider a serious crime, which often, as we have seen in the world, um, you know, they use cybercrime laws to define online content as uh, serious crimes. So how concerned are you about this uh, risk and what will you do in order to avoid it? Thank you. If I may, um, please begin here. I, I think that um, the basis of all this evidence sharing for uh, any crime or serious crime, because then there's still uh, it's still an open subject, but it's on the basis that it's uh, dual criminality, like like Brian said at the beginning. So uh, it needs to be a crime in my jurisdiction for me to be able to cooperate with another country with this evidence. So otherwise, uh, you know, if it's a political crime, there will, there will not be any evidence sharing, uh, just an ex as an example. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so I agree with Claudio on that. Uh, of course, that doesn't necessarily fully address the concern of two authoritarian or repressive governments uh, having dual criminality on an offense that other countries believe shouldn't be an offense in the first place or shouldn't be a serious crime. Um, and that's where we get back to the point that several uh, panelists have already made, which is the linkages between the scope and other provisions of the treaty. So um, many countries, uh, Canada perhaps most prominently in the last round of negotiations, um, have emphasized the importance of having uh, provisions in the treaty that make clear uh, in various ways that there need to be safeguards uh, in addition to dual criminality that are sort of universal um, as to the, the limitations on the ways that the treaty might be uh, abused um, to uh, support the prosecution of offenses that are in violation of human rights um, or otherwise uh, you know, discriminatory um, or contrary to, to other important sort of values and principles. Um, it remains to be seen, you know, how those concepts uh, will be incorporated into the treaty. Obviously, that's what we're all doing here and, and will be doing in the next round. Um, but I do share some of the optimism that I think other panelists have expressed about the, the modalities that we have giving us the opportunity to uh, achieve an appropriate balance um, on, those, on those issues. Um, and I, I also will just say, I think... Um, the, the trade in the scope between narrow criminalization and a slightly broader um, range of cooperation, I think, is still an effective one. I think we are better off, generally speaking, um, with uh, supporting the idea of, of broad electronic evidence sharing um, than we would be if we were still mired in debates over the, the sort of long list of potential cyber-enabled offenses that countries would otherwise feel the need to criminalize at an international level in order to get the range of cooperation that they think they need to be effective. 
Thank you both. I think the point is really well taken uh, to consider not just what would you know an impl implementation of this treaty look like in a context that you are familiar with and comfortable with in terms of the prevailing sort of governments uh, and, and, and values, but also how might it be uh, used and employed in you know two countries that have wildly different uh, sets of, of values in play. Um, that does bring us very close, and in fact, at the end. Um, so I, I, I just, uh, Perhaps one last, you know, for 20 seconds each, uh, how are you defining success at the end of this process um, as we sort of rapidly approach um, the, the last round of negotiations? Um, and I will start in the room and then we'll finish online with Claudio and then Bryony with the last word. So I'll, you know, fill my glass halfway again. I mean, I think in some ways we've already succeeded in the sense that we have taken what was a divisive process that we did not support at the beginning and established modalities of participation for both member states and stakeholders that are inclusive and that whatever the challenges have fostered a very expert driven um, and uh, wide ranging sort of diverse participation in uh, six very intensive rounds of negotiation. So whatever that sort of outcome is, um, the process really has been valuable, I think, uh, regardless. Um, but I'll also just endorse uh, what other panelists have said, you know, for the treaty to be effective, it will need to be consensus-based and widely subscribed. A criminal justice treaty doesn't work if it doesn't have, uh, you know, near universal subscription from UN member states. And so we need to always keep that in mind. And a treaty that has only a small number of ratifications will, will not be a success. Basically, Mike has said most of what I wanted to say. Uh, success really looks like uh, we need this process to conclude with an effective instrument that that supports international cooperation between national law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies to fight um, and truly reduce the <laughs> incidence of serious cyber criminal activity online. Um, that can only be done with a narrow scope and focusing on the commonalities and adopted by consensus that actually not only uh, goes into signing and ratification, but actual proper implementation. Otherwise, I think we've wasted, what, four years? <laughs> Claudio, over to you. Yep, I basically uh, agree with what Mike and, and Timia you said. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, the uh, success or, or failure of this, uh, the way I see it, it's the combination of the usefulness of the provisions that uh, finally make it into the text of the convention, uh, especially the procedural ones, which are the, the tools that we need for, for investigation and cooperation. And the combination of that with the number of states that ultimately ratify it, uh, because of what I've said a couple of times. Thank and you. Brian, the last word to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, John and, and everyone. Um, it, I, it's not a secret that Australia was initially skeptical about the need for this convention. And I think there are quite a few people in the room who um, had that initial view, but we were convinced and have been convinced over the last few years by the potential opportunities that this could be one of the most worthwhile things that is done in the UN on any type of issue in cyber this decade. Um, but we are very far from realizing that level of ambition. Uh, so to be a little bit pragmatic at the very end, um, for me personally, um, success for this process is if we don't break anything that's already working. Um, and if we do that, then I think um, we've, we've won compared to where we were at the beginning of this process. Could not have said it better myself on any of these fronts. Uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Please join me in giving them a very large round of applause. And thank you all. Thanks again to IGF and have a wonderful rest of the week.